the Most Holy. So if you go back to this graphic over here, the veil that's being spoken about is this one here. The one that divides the Holy from the Most Holy will be depicted with cherubims on it. And remember that's the eastern side. The side here it says thou shalt make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet with cherubims. The angels that were put there were put on the eastern side. That is the veil. That is the, the blockage now that separates God from His people. God is no longer at one with His people. Now there's a better picture. You can see the, the various colors and also on there are depicted the angels of God separating the most holy from the holy place. And when that closed, I'm talking spiritually now brothers and sisters, when the spiritual door closed, Adam and Eve recognized and realized that they were naked. So did Adam and Eve walk in the sanctuary? Yes they did. Let's have a look. Moses walked in the sanctuary. Adam and Eve walked in the sanctuary. What about Abraham? Did he walk in the sanctuary? Well, let me ask you a question. Where did Abraham live spiritually? Was Adam a man that studied the Word of God? Yes. Was Adam a man that spread and preached and shared the Word of God? Yes. Was Adam a man that prayed diligently? Yes. Adam was, uh, I beg your pardon, Abraham was a man that lived his life spiritually in the holy place. Now the Lord asks him to do something. Listen. And it came to pass that God said to Abraham, Take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering. Please note for a moment here. The Lord is saying to Abraham, Take your son, your only son, and sacrifice him. Can you see a parallel? God the Father sends his son, his only begotten son, whom he loves, to sacrifice him. Here he says to Abraham, you take your son, your only son, whom you love and sacrifice him. What's being played here is a parallel between Abraham and Isaac and God the Father and Jesus. Let's read on. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and went unto the place with, uh, of which God had told him. And on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and he laid it upon Isaac, just like the Lord laid the cross upon Jesus, the cross of sin. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife and they went both of them together. And Isaac spoke unto Abraham his father and said, My father, I see the fire, behold the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Ab listen to these words. And Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. Can you see that? The, the Lord is showing Abraham. He's prefiguring something. He's saying, uh, let me test whether you are walking as I will have to walk. Sending my son, my only begotten son whom I love. I will have to lay the wood. I'll have to lay the cross on my son and have him sacrificed. Listen, and they came to the place which God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there, and laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac uh, uh, his son, and laid him upon the altar of wood, just like the Lord laid Jesus on the cross. And the Lord said, Because you have done this thing, and have not withhold your son, thine only son, I will bless thee. It's a very beautiful parallel, brothers and sisters, between Jesus and Isaac between Abraham and God the Father. Remember Abraham living in the holy place would have had to walk three days out into the wilderness to sacrifice his son. Um, what is out in the wilderness? The sacrificial altar. Can you see that in your mind? So let's ask. Moses walked in the sanctuary. Adam and Eve walked in the sanctuary. Abraham walked in the sanctuary. What about Joshua? Did he walk in the sanctuary? Well, remember that uh, the Lord called Israel from Egypt into Canaan. Now, before they can go into Canaan, something has to happen. Joshua said unto the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. And Joshua spoke unto the priests, saying, Take up the ark of this covenant and pass over 
before the people. And they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went before the people. Look at that, brothers and sisters. God's people are about to pass over into Canaan. Something is happening. And it came to pass that they that bore the ark were come unto the Jordan. What's lying ahead of them there? It's the antitype of the Red Sea. And the feet of the priests that bore the ark were dipped in the brim of the water. Watch there. And the waters which came down from above stood and rose up upon a heap. And the priests that bore the ark of the covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan. And all the Israelites passed over on dry ground. And those twelve stones which they took out of the Jordan did Joshua pitch in Gilgal. And he spoke unto the children of Israel, saying, Let your children know, saying, This is Israel came over the Jordan, watch, on dry land. Can you see the movement? Passing over through the Jordan into the Holy Land. Brothers and sisters, what a truth. What a template. And what a simplicity there is in Christ. It's one of the greatest honors to study the sanctuary. To see how mankind walks and moves through the sanctuary. What about Paul? Well, did Paul somehow believe in the sanctuary? Well, all the texts we've read up to now, you can see Paul knew and believed the sanctuary. Speaking about Moses and talking about the heavenly sanctuary. But what about what he personally believed? Did Jesus... A bigger pardon. Did Paul walk in the sanctuary? Well, let's find out. Let's go back to the sanctuary. But this I confess to you, says Paul, that according to the way which they call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down by the law and the prophets and written in the prophets. So always I take pains to have a clear conscience towards both God and man. What Paul is saying here is, it doesn't matter if it's inconvenient or if it's unpopular or if they say that you are belonging to a sect. If you, like Paul, believe according to all the law and all the prophets, well, then you might have a good conscience towards God and man. Let's read it again. This I, Paul, confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, that's a pretty derogative name, I worship the God of our fathers according to that sect, making sure that I believe everything laid down by the law, so everything in line with the sanctuary and the law and the Moses, etc., and written in the prophets. So I always take pains to have a clear conscience towards both God and man. Do you know that the Ten Commandments are split into two sections? Four towards God and six towards man. What Paul's saying here is, I always take pains to have a clear conscience towards God and man. I keep the first four commandments and I keep the last six commandments. And yes, the people say that I belong to a sect. But this is according to the sanctuary, according to Moses, according to the law and all the prophets. Brothers and sisters, we've seen Moses, Adam and Eve, Abraham, Joshua, Paul in the sanctuary. What about you and me? How do we feature in the sanctuary? Let's look at this. Number one, brothers and sisters, we need to accept Jesus as our personal Savior. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. That's the first step you do. You worship the Lord for the fact that He is King of Kings. Secondly, second step. You accept that Jesus died on your behalf. You accept His sacrifice as the sacrificial atonement for your sins. You know that you were not re redeemed with corruptible things, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, brothers and sisters. Jesus said to them, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again I cannot see the kingdom of God. What's the next wait, thing waiting for us there, brothers and sisters? It's the water, the womb, the watery womb of the rebirth. Step three, repent, confess your sins and be baptized. Then Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And what's waiting after that? Living a sanctified Christian life. 
the movement, brothers and sisters, into the holy place. Study Jesus, the word of God. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. I am the bread of life, says Jesus. Pray through Jesus, the altar of incense. Let my prayer be set forth thee as incense. Watch ye therefore and pray always, says the Lord. Share Jesus, the light of the world. I am the light of the world. You are the light of the world. Go ye therefore and spread that light of the world. Teach all nations. Brothers and sisters, can you see the steps, how it's methodically laid out? You accept Jesus. You then acknowledge the cross. You are baptized and you become a Christian. Step by step by step. The business plan of salvation is the simplicity that is in Christ. There's another step which is going to take us into the most holy. But I will be discussing that in depth in the next or the final couple of presentations. Like J.L. Schuller told us, there is no other work subject which so fully unites all the parts of the Bible into one harmonious whole as the subject of the sanctuary. Every gospel truth centers in the sanctuary service. All of the temple, all of it is saying glory. This is truly the everlasting gospel, the theme of all scripture, the message which goes to all people, all nations and all ages because His way is in the sanctuary. Brothers and sisters, this is the message of Christ. The unchangeable truths that are found in the sanctuary. I pray that you're going to come back as we now look at the other aspects. The conflict between Jesus and Satan. The great controversy. And then it's going to get even more and more interesting as we go deeper and deeper and deeper into the sanctuary. Thank you for spending the time with us.